Warning. The following program contains flashing imagery and content which may be considered harmful or traumatizing to some. Viewer discretion is extremely advised. Welcome to the darkest depths. Ruthie Mae McCoy grew up on Chicago's South Side and began exhibiting symptoms of mental illness in her 20s. She would regularly talk to herself and curse at strangers on the street, often sudden and unpredictably. Because of her mental illness, Ruthie was unable to hold a steady job, and she had also been institutionalized several times throughout her life. Regardless, in 1983, she would find herself living in Chicago's ABLA homes where residents are beaten, raped, and murdered more than twice as often as they are citywide. Despite living in the ghetto, Ruthie was determined to leave the projects in the months before 1987. She had just been approved for social security income by the government, which also paid retroactively from the date of her application. This meant that not only did she have a permanent monthly income, but the first check would be nearly $2,000, which was a large sum of money for someone living in the projects. Although she intended to use her money to leave the ABLA homes, she bought some new clothes and a few things for her home first. Unfortunately, those few purchases drew eyes from the large building that she was in. It was becoming evident to her neighbors that Ruthie now all of a sudden had money. Enough to matter. On April 22, 1987, Chicago Police Department received a frantic phone call from Ruthie Mae McCoy. Recordings show that Ruthie told them that people were coming in through her bathroom medicine cabinet from the apartment on the other side, and those people were trying to kill her. A police patrol was sent to Ruthie's apartment, 1109. But before the cops could even arrive, Chicago 911 received several other calls from neighbors reporting gunshots and shouting. When they got to her apartment, they knocked on the door, but no one answered. A couple of officers went to management to retrieve a key for her apartment, but for some reason, it didn't fit the lock. The officers then contacted the project office again, but the janitor said there was no other key for 1109, and with that, the police left the building. The following evening, police got a call from Deborah Lassley, the next-door neighbor of Ruthie Mae. Deborah said that Ruthie stopped by her apartment every day, twice a day, religiously. But on that day, she hadn't stopped at all. About half a dozen officers and security guards went back to Ruthie Mae's apartment. But again, their knocks and calls from McCoy went unanswered. Neighbors say that most of the police officers thought that they should have broke the door down, but the security guards talked them out of it, citing tenant lawsuits and security after the fact. And with that, the police officers shrugged and left again. Seeing that the police would be of no help, Deborah Lastly contacted the management office, who immediately sent maintenance to Ruthie McCoy's apartment and finally got the door open. And there they came across a grisly scene. Ruthie Mae McCoy was found in her bedroom. She had been shot four times with a medium caliper gun. Autopsy results showed that she died from internal bleeding as the fourth and fatal bullet passed through her right upper arm, then entered her chest and severed her pulmonary vein. The bedroom she was in had been ransacked. Papers, magazines, and coins were strewn around her on the floor. When police later turned McCoy slightly, the faint smell of rotting flesh rose through the apartment. Detectives learned that the killers had entered the home to the adjacent apartment by breaking through the bathroom's medicine cabinet. The mode of entry didn't surprise residents of the high-rises. Intruders have been breaking into their apartments through medicine cabinets for at least a year. Gangbangers would often link apartments to the bathrooms that way, providing an escape route should police enter. Some residents would position furniture in front of their bathroom doors before going to bed. Two members of the Gangster Disciples, 18-year-old Ted Turner and 21-year-old John Honduras, were charged with the murder, home invasion, armed robbery, and residential burglary of Ruthie Mae McCoy. Witnesses say they saw the two men carrying Ruthie's 19-inch color TV and rocking chair around the building during the early morning hours after her death. 
But due to lack of evidence, the charges against the two men were dropped after two years of trial. As of today, there is no further evidence or suspects, and the murder of Ruthie Mae McCoy remains unsolved. Thank you for watching Darkest Depths. Follow on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok for the absolute worst that humanity has to offer in true crime and horror. Merchandise available through teespring.com. Episode requests made through darkestdepths2crime at gmail.com. No one is safe.